Hi, hey everyone. Welcome to the Good News Podcast. Oh my goodness, this is going to be an incredible experience that you you're going to share with us here. This is this is a conversation with J. L. Richardson, and uh, in in some ways, uh, in my mind, a celebrity. You'll hear a bit more about that. Um, yeah, just an incredible, best-selling author uh, lives in Brampton. Most importantly, a beautiful person that has an incredible message that she's sharing with the world. Uh, we get down into the details of of how do you even write and the disciplines that are necessary. Necessary. This is a great conversation. Uh, goes lots of different places. I think you're going to really enjoy it, friends. Let's dive in. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to the Good News Podcast. As always, grateful for your joining us in this conversation. I am super duper pumped for this conversation. This is someone who, uh, in our house is definitely a, a little bit of a celebrity. And my <laughs> wife was uh, reading reading JL's book, Gutter Child, a, a number of years ago and came downstairs and said, do you know that she's from Brampton? And so anyway, we're going to get into things, uh, as I said in the introduction, just quite a, quite a track record and a, an amazing way that God has been working through JL's life. JL, thanks so much for uh, joining us on the Good News Podcast today. Really, really great to meet you and looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited about it too. Cool, cool. Um, let's just start with writing and yeah. how did you get into writing, becoming an author and yeah, what, what, how did that process all work for mm -hmm. you? And did you ever imagine that it would become what it is today? Oh, that's a, that's a tricky question because I'll, I'll start with the first cool. one. Yeah. We'll come back. If I don't answer okay. that, if you, would you have ever yeah, imagined absolutely. come back to it? Cause it's kind of an interesting answer and cool. I don't know if I'll remember. Cool. Um, so when I was when I was in high school, I actually thought I knew I was more interested in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that's where I was leading. I played sports as well, so I loved playing basketball and soccer, running track. But I had that feeling that I was going to be an art student mm -hmm. or an arts okay. something. I took all the English classes. I took all the arts classes. I avoided all the math and sciences as much as possible. Um, and so I, I knew that about myself, but I definitely didn't know I was going to be a writer. I definitely didn't have it like hmm. on the trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, I think at some point I sort of thought it would be nice to have a book, mm. but like not in the way that people are writing stories in grade nine, grade 10, grade 11 and tucking them away in corners. I, I wasn't that. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I went to university and I started to read black authors mm -hmm. that I really started to think about the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. cool. And it was when I was in a theater class on playwriting that I really felt that like kind of calling, you know, the, mm -hmm. the term calling, we use that a lot in the church, but that that yeah. thing happened in you where you're like, oh, I, I think I want to do this more, or I think I might be good at this, or I mm. think something special yeah. is happening. And I was I was writing, um, I was doing a, an acting exercise and they sort of said, I'm going to give you a word and then you're going to perform it in the in your, as your character. <laughs> and um, so she said, a well, and I said, a corner, a hole that's deep, that's evil, that's bad, that's dark, and I'm dark and I'm wow. bad. And I started like welling up and mm. crying and I realized how many things I had kept kind of locked inside of me, like mm. hurts, pains, struggles, frustrations. And I found writing to be a way that those things were able to come out. Mm. And so that's that was the beginning. And then my brother sort of suggested I write a story or I write my dad's life story. Mm. My dad was the first black quarterback to win the Grey Cup. Mm. And he had this fascinating story of winning all these games. He went undefeated in high school, undefeated in college, was never drafted into the NFL, mm. was picked up by the CFL, and then won the Grey Cup in his first year. Mm. And like it, it writes itself. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I decided to go into a master's nice. in creative writing program, write this book, and then I would become a prof. And that was sort of my ultimate career goal. I would put this book together for my dad, for my family, and then I would become a professor. And as soon as I finished The Stone Thrower, which mm -hmm. is the book about my dad's life, mm -hmm. the idea for Gutter Child came about. And mm. it was like signed off on Stone Thrower, boom, the next day. Really? I'm like, I'm thinking about these scars, this debt, like all these things. And that's that's when I knew I was going to be a writer wow. because I realized it wasn't just like a one-off thing uh -huh. that I was just like, every time I finished a book, I was going to have another idea and another idea and another Amazing. Idea. Uh, yeah. So it was after you wrote your first book yeah. that you really felt, I'm, I think yes. you're going to maybe be an author yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. That's and then, so cool. And then your question was, yeah. did you ever imagine? Yeah. What's funny is, 
I think sometimes, I don't know if it's a youngest child thing, but I thought I was going to be somebody pretty important. Like I thought I had pictured myself doing speeches Amazing. before. I thought I was going to be an actor and then I would go into okay. this like long acting career. And so it's weird to say this, but there were times in which I pictured this life for myself. Mm. I living it now, it's like, I can't believe it's real, mm. but it feels like I knew a little bit mm. that this was where I was yeah. at it. Like yeah. I, I, and, and if yeah. you ask, I was thinking about this the other day. If you ask any of my high school classmates, I don't think any of them is surprised <laughs> cool. because I was just like, I was that kid. I okay. was like leading things and running okay. things and organizing okay. things. And, yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Just, uh, absolutely. And all of that comes into what you're doing now. Yeah. You have the courage to exactly. put into writing your thought that other, you know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm a pretty loud person. They're probably most yeah. surprised that I'm a writer because I'm so oh, loud. Okay. <laughs> I was so chatty. That's so awesome. that part is the surprising. I think you think a lot of writers is being quiet yeah. and writing in their offices and yeah. that's the hardest part yes. for me. But the the speaking and so being on stage. Introverted, extroverted, which would you fall on? So I was extreme. I have been extremely extroverted all my life. Okay. I feel like through COVID, into COVID and coming out of COVID, I become more and more introverted mm, every year almost. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just really yeah. like being alone and I did never, I never wanted to be alone when I was younger. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I, okay. Well, I, I'd love to talk later about disciplines <laughs> and how you write. And, you know, yeah, yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, but, yeah. but you mentioned about um, reading black authors yes. was a significant, yeah. Yeah. you know, right? Something happened. Yeah. Um, my wife's a teacher yeah. with the Peel Board math teacher. And um, I'm hearing lots from her these days, which I'm really grateful for how the education system, at least in Peel, is really trying to um, <laughs> redeem mm -hmm. uh, some years where this has been happening, but definitely raise up. Um, anti-black racism and yeah. really working at part of that is raising up in, in the case even in math she is she is bringing forward like people in history who are black who have brought in new math equations and work and, and just like she's got this poster with with all these uh, amazing black mathematicians and just try you know so yeah. so it's like yeah like that's really important and and just want to say as a as a white middle-aged male how important that that is and really grateful that that's happening um around uh, experiencing black authors, reading black authors. Can, can we go back to like what that was like for you? What was going on for you that kind of led to where you, you are today? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question because I was a big reader all my life. Okay. I read all the books that teachers were assigning yeah. in class. And here's the thing. I loved them. Mm. Like I, I loved Shakespeare. <laughs> um, I loved, <laughs> I loved, great. I loved reading um, Stone Angel. I loved these books that I think a lot of people are like, that's kind of boring mm. or that's really difficult. And I think it's because I had an affinity for it. Sure. I really yeah. liked literature. I loved pulling apart themes. I loved talking about them. Um, and so to be honest, I, I loved English classes and I didn't think there was anything really wrong with them, mm. to be honest. Mm. But when I went to university and I started reading black authors, mm. I started to hear uh, answers to the doubts and questions I had about being black and mm. about whether I'd ever, you know, there were questions about whether I wanted to be mm. black, whether I had ever found myself pretty or beautiful or attractive. Mm. And I realized the danger of not reading black authors for me was that I had constructed really problematic views of myself mm. and about my community. And I had very, um, I had very stereotypical views about the mm. black community in some ways, even though I am black sure. yeah. because I didn't have a lot of family members who were black. I didn't have any family members. My family's really small and quite nuclear. And the families that are alongside us, a lot of our, our Christian family in, in particular are white. Mm. And so you start to see for me what writing and storytelling can do in terms of affirming who you are mm. and helping you see the world and helping you see yourself in the world in a more healthy and wholesome way. But I also see the value in reading other stories. Mm. And that's what you that's what you learn when you've seen yourself and you've not seen yourself. Mm. And that really frames a lot of what I do right now, which mm. is trying to read different kinds of voices, mm. trying to learn about different kinds of communities through literature. I love it. Mm. Um, and I always say, you know, books are a great way to explore different communities because you're able to do it at a really safe pace and mm. safe distance. Mm -hmm. If you don't know something about a particular community, the Muslim community, the mm -hmm. queer community, the trans community, reading a novel by an mm. author from that community and multiple books by authors from that community yeah. really helps you confront mm. some of the things that maybe you've been taught that are not right mm -hmm. or are not true or, you know, and so... 
I think the experience of reading those black authors was helpful because it helped me understand myself, Mm -hmm. but it also helped me understand what everybody needs, Mm -hmm. which is to see themselves and to not see themselves in literature and to have those two things working together. Mm, Amazing. I love the encouragement to read from authors who are different from us to really get a sense of of what their life is like. And yeah, yeah, that listening piece that can come through reading. Well, because if you don't read the thing, the danger is you don't read about the community and then you see them in everyday life, which you will. Um, There's a danger of being really terrible (laughs) or saying something that's harmful. Yeah. And so the great thing about books is they can help you navigate a little bit of that. Build that gap a little bit. Yeah, and build some compassion, which I think is often missing. Yeah, um, When it's a community we only see on movies or in movies or on TV. Um, and so that's that's the great thing about a book. You can kind of, I, I read a book recently that was really difficult for me. Mm. That was about a community I wasn't familiar with. And I struggled at certain parts. I was like, oh, that's too much. Mm. Oh, I don't know. And what I realized by the time I got to the end was like, I had to, the level of compassion, the level of similarity mm. between me and the, the mm. main character helped me see the similarities in real life. And the things I was uncomfortable with were things I needed to, wrestle with myself. Mm, amazing. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, as a, as a black author yeah. yourself, I, um, boy, we've got systems that, that, uh, that really it still enable racism, yeah. unfortunately. Um, hopefully we are moving yeah. and have moved, but what has that experience been like for you as a, as a black author? I think for me, I've, I've enjoyed a, a, a tremendous amount of privilege. And okay. I think that has to be said first, because I think that while I am a black author, and I do write about race and racism, and those are things that I'm really like passionate about sure, and interested yeah. in and curious about. I think there are Black authors who don't want to write about race and racism mm. and don't want to wrestle with these issues. And sometimes publishing can kind of say, like, we want you to deal with the hard stuff, the mm. Black stuff. Um, mm. And I think, too, I, I, I've i come from a very like middle, upper class family sure. background. And so I... I've been able to not have to rely on okay. book income to like live my mm-hmm. everyday life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that those privileges mean that um, I've had it a little bit easier than some. Mm. Um, I was able to go to a master's program and from my master's program, my prof recommended me to a publisher and the publisher published me. And I've had, you know, some no's for sure. I've been turned down by agents. I've been turned down by some publishers for my books. But every book that I've wanted to get published has gotten published. Cool. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's it's mm. it's something that I I see as a rarity, mm-hmm. and I recognize like I I have to own um, mm. what may not be possible for everybody else mm. in the same way, and the road that might be quite difficult for mm-hmm. others. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Hey, let's jump into some of the books and reading. Yeah. So, Gut- Gutter Child. Yes. Um. Where did that come from? Mm-hmm. How did you how did you go about that? Especially really kind of being your first book that wasn't, hey, write this for your dad, yeah. right? This is kind of your exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, where did where did it all come from for you? What yeah. Mm-hmm. Got a child is like, you're not supposed to have a favorite, but right now she's my favorite. I wondered. <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to ask you, but yeah, I wasn't sure yeah, if I could. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's you're not cool. really supposed to have that's a favorite. Cool. I think because <laughs> it's like your children. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I think because the memoir, Stone Thrower, I loved working on it. I loved talking with my dad about yeah. the stories. I loved what it provided for me in terms of a structure. Um, You know, my dad's life is his life. I didn't have to like guess things or make things up. Um, But Gutter Child is the exact opposite. It's a dystopia, which means that I can make up whatever I wanted. Mm. I can make anything, anything. Mm. And that has a kind of freedom that um, is fun, but it's also terrifying. Mm. And so the fact that it actually came together and reads like a story and lots of people have read it, that feels like a dream to me. Um, and so the inspiration behind Gutter Child was my dad's story. Um, when I was working on uh, the book and researching my dad's life, I was really fascinated and troubled by the civil rights movement in the mm. United States and by what looked to me like a nation that had been built for the failure of the black community. Mm. And I couldn't help but see in my dad's life, in the lives of other uh, athletes, in the lives of the women, um, just a system that was failing Mm. and a system that was, um, I should say that it was failing on some hands, but Mm. it was also doing exactly what I felt it was built to do on Mm. another. Mm. And I was really troubled by that. And so the idea for Gutter Child was to build a system that was designed for the failure of some Mm. and to see how they would navigate it. Mm. And the question I was dealing with was, what happens when you grow up in a world that's designed for your failure? 
when do you realize it and what do you do about it? Mm. And the main character wow. uh, is Elamina and she is, she was born in the gutter and the gutter is this place where um, Sosi people are born and scarred on both hands and they're born with debt. They sort of inherit the mm. debt of their ancestors. Mm. And um, the whole goal is to pay off their debt. When you pay off your debt, you're sort of a redeemed citizen. Okay. And uh, Elamine is part of this project that pulls her out of that system and says, what happens if you're raised by mainlanders? Can you mm. beat the odds? Because mm. the odds were really stacked against folks. And so the book starts when Elamina's um, mainland mother has passed away. And now she's sent into the gutter system um, at, a, at an academy. And she has to figure out, first of all, what is the scar and what does it mean? And why does everybody else have two scars? And then she has to figure out how she's going to pay off her debt. Mm. And that was the premise that I had from the very beginning. All kinds of other things in the book changed as I was writing it. But the premise of the scars and the debt were really important because I wanted a visual symbol on folks' bodies that mm. said, we were born this way. This way. Yeah. We were born part of a failed system okay. and we're wow. we're the punished ones. Mm. And then I wanted debt that was different character to character so that there was the sense that some people were carrying more than others. Mm. Some people's journeys might be easier than others, mm. but is it really easier? Yeah. Um, so those were that was sort of the beginning of that book. I, I'm so curious. <laughs> like how how does it all work? Like how much of that was in your mind yeah. before you started and how much sort of came, oh, I should add this. Or yeah. This, yeah, yeah, yeah. How does that work? In an ideal world, you spend a lot of time thinking it through and then just writing it. I did not do that. <laughs> I had the idea of the scars and the debt, and then I just started writing. Okay. Like scars, debt, Elmina. That was pretty much cool. all I really knew. Um, and so I spent eight years writing Gutter Child because I wow. had no idea what I was doing. Um, oh my goodness. The first four years were like just all over the place. And then at the four year mark, I went to a writer's retreat and my instructor said, you know, you need to stop working on the first half of the book and you need to figure out what the ending to this is. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> you kind of need a target. To... <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a stupid idea. Um, but I did crazy. it. I just decided to write all the way to the end. Wow. And then every time I was working on the book, I would just try and, and fix one thing in the okay. manuscript. That's what she told me. Instead of trying to make each chapter perfect before you get to the next chapter. Oh my goodness. Write the whole book out. And then when you get to the end, go back to the beginning and figure out what's the thing you're going to focus on in this next draft. Wow. And what's the thing you're going to focus on the next time through. And that really helped me move a lot faster through the manuscript because I had a, I wouldn't focus on one problem too long. And I also was only dealing with one problem at a time. Mm, okay. So okay. Um, that's been kind of the, that was the process for that book. And it, I, it's working for the next book too. So it's, it's how I should have done things. From okay. The start. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What, uh, yeah. Done is better than perfect. Yeah. Like, and so there are parts of, there are parts of the book that came in really late. Okay. Um, so there's the, the healers yeah. in the book that I, you know, Christian folks and church folks will be like, oh, I know who that is. Um, but the, so that cool. came in quite late. I was having okay. a bit of like a crisis of faith and I felt like I needed to deal with my crisis of faith in the book. And so I threw these particular characters Man. in, in this particular moment where um, Alamina comes across a healer who is sort of offering to like give her sort of temporary help. But she's really mm. like, I need more. I, mm. I need I need real help. Mm. Like this thing that we're in is not right. Mm. And uh, that was a really important moment for me. Um, and then I was finishing up the book in 2020, which was the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter um, movement sort of all like culminating so that's into when the one. Gutter Child that's when I finished the book. I was wrapping up the book June 2020. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I actually took out the last chapter of the book and changed the ending because I was so frustrated by what was going on in the world. And I felt like the book needed to end with a little bit less certainty mm. and a little bit less um neatness because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i was really quite yeah yeah mad yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i just thought you know yeah yeah <laughs> i don't care yeah absolutely you know like deal with it yeah kind of which is real eh? yeah. very real yeah. wow uh impact from the book yeah. Uh, yeah what 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 how where what happened after you were done and yeah, so where is it gone going and what are your hopes with you know still yeah yeah mm -hmm. so the book came out in 2021 so yeah. i finished it in 2020 summer of 2020 it takes about six months from the time you kind of sign off on it um, so it came out in January, 2021 in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and so the good thing about that time frame for authors is it was definitively pandemic time. So mm. it wasn't like the early folks who came out in 2020 where it was like 
what do we do with this pandemic? Mm. I don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like 2022 when Mm -hmm. it was sort of like, are we done? Can we come out and play? Like it was solidly, we're home, lock it down. And so I spent, you know, the first four months of that book on virtual tour. Um, I was in my office all the time, kind of like this. um, And just doing event after event, book club after book club from my office. Um, So it was weird because I was really busy and it felt great. And the book made the bestsellers list and was on it for about eight weeks. Mm, And that was wild. That's amazing. Um, It was uh, shortlisted for the Amazon First Novel Award. It was like a lot of great things happened, but I never left my house. So (laughs) it it was a very, I think it was ideal for me in a lot of ways. It was very humbling because all these good things were happening, but I couldn't really like go out and celebrate or wear fancy clothes or, Mm. you know, go out for a gala night out. And I don't know. I feel like that's right for me to kind of have like a bit of a, you don't need, you don't need it. Were you able to do all that (laughs) without having to do all that? Yeah. And, and just sort of like kept me grounded. I would finish an event Mm. and then I just go to my, I remember doing the Amazon first novel award night and I just like went to watch like law and order right (laughs) after the like it was just whatever, you know? So, uh, So it was exciting. And then I think what's been strange is now in 2023, I've done a couple of events at a couple of schools. I've gone a couple places and people are like, oh, I read your book two years ago. We love it. A hundred students read it every year. And I'm like, what? You know, it's it's really strange that it's so entrenched already in some school systems and programs and that students love it and teachers love teaching it. And then I have like almost no idea that that was happening. Oh man. Praise God. Like that's so cool. eh? It's really cool. It's really cool. And to be honest, you know, I talked about, I'd always dream my life and be like, I thought that the stone thrower would do really well. Mm. Um, And I'm not even talking about my writing. I just thought because my dad's story was so compelling that it would, you know, turn into a movie and all these things would happen. And it didn't, Mm -hmm. it didn't, it did fine, but it didn't like, and so to have it happen with gutter child has been really nice and really special Mm -hmm. and been really sort of like, whoa, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. very cool. Awesome. Um, Maybe let's take another yeah. one of your writings. Resurrection Sunday. Of course, I have to bring that. Yes. Very interesting. What, That's what, like a very what, secret story most what, people don't know what, about. So yeah, where'd that come from? What's yeah. it about? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Resurrection Sunday, oh, it's such a deep dive into the past, it feels like. Mm. Um, Resurrection Sunday is a short story that I wrote for a collection. Okay. Um, and I had never written a short story before. And I have, to this day written two. Okay. And when you say short story, how, how long would a short story be? I think that one had to be, I want to say under 5,000 words or okay. something like that Okay. in the 2,500 to 5,000 words. It might've been yeah. even shorter. Cause I remember really struggling to get the, the cut down. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I've written two short stories in my life and I find them exceptionally difficult. Mm. And I just, I don't know what it is. I've written children's books. I've written longer books, but short stories are like the thing that I try and avoid at this point. Uh, But that one, it just came to me. It just, I had this idea of a pastor who gets hired at a church and no one knows that it's, that the pastor is a woman until the moment she shows Mm. up on stage. And I just, I thought like, that was, I always create a challenge in all of my books. And that was the challenge for that one. Mm. Like, how do I build it? How does the conversation happen where she doesn't, no one knows until this one moment? And then how does the congregation respond? (sighs) So that one was really fun to write, but also very hard. And I was really glad it That's got cool. picked up and published. And again, what, what kind of impact would you get from something like that? That was really secret because it's in a collection with a smaller press. Okay. I, I haven't heard a lot sure. from okay. people who've yeah. read it. So yeah. even you yeah. saying that you read yeah. it, I'm like, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like the secret story that's out in the wilderness, <laughs> that's awesome. the world somewhere. Well, I would encourage people to read it. Yeah, yeah find for sure. It, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And love the lifting up of women in leadership, yes. like big time. Yeah. It's such a yeah. fascinating yeah. conversation. And it's one of those ones that's really tricky for me because mm. I've grown up in the church and I've often had leadership roles like in youth and those kinds yeah. of things. And I realize the, I mean, most people realize the value women mm. bring into a room and the value of that diversity brings to mm. the room. It can be mm. hard, but it's, yeah. it's good. And the resistance around it is is wild mm. to me because mm-hmm. it's just like you're actually preventing growth, Mm -hmm. I think, because there are things that women, that marginalized folks see. Absolutely. That folks who've always had their voices out there, who've always seen themselves reflected back, just you can't see. Mm -hmm. You can't know. No. And you really have to like quiet and pay attention and watch for things Mm -hmm. or you'll miss them. Mm -hmm. And you'll continue to do really harmful things or engage in 
in less helpful practices. Yeah. If yeah. you don't just say like, whoa, maybe I don't need to talk so much. Or yeah. maybe someone else deserves to be on the mic. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that was really a, a fun story to write. Mm -hmm. that's, that was the driving thing too, right? In the story, there's this moment where she notices people in the congregation that other people didn't notice. Mm -hmm. And there's this really important connection that happens. And that's really what I wanted to think about as well. What happens when somebody different takes the mic? Absolutely. What do they see and what can they do about it? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you for writing it. <laughs> and I challenge and encourage all of us to keep yeah, living into yeah, it. Yeah, 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 for sure. That's yeah. cool. Um, really curious about how you write, you know, because mm. it's one thing to get the finished product and everybody celebrates that and yep. look at jail, yep. you know, so, but, but like kind of the the nitty gritty behind the scenes that people don't see or know about, you know, and I'm thinking about things like, how do you, like, what's your, what's your day? Like, what's yeah. your week? Like, how do you even get writing done? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's start there. Cause I got the zillion other questions, but I'm just very curious. <laughs> it, yeah. It's chaotic. Okay. It's chaotic. So some people write every day that happens sometimes. Like sometimes I have a, a burst of energy for okay. a project and I will write every day and it, I tend to write operate in bursts. So I'll want to write every day, all day for a certain amount of time. And then I'll be like, I'm not writing at all for a long okay. time because I can't figure something out. Okay. And oftentimes the problem is, is these two things conflict. Mm. If I have a burst where I want to write and it's a very busy time at work, I can't mm. quite navigate that. Okay. If I have a lot of time and the burst isn't happening, oh. I'm just kind of like, okay. Yeah. yeah. What's that like? That must but be. But I'll talk about yeah. the ideal. Okay. Okay. The, ideal the ideal scenario ideal. is that the burst we'll start comes there. Yeah. and you have the time to, to do it. But my practice is very much um, that layered approach that I kind of talked about. Mm. So I try and start an idea and think it through. Well, first of all, I'll say this. I never know what my next project is until my first, the project before it is done. Mm. So I didn't know I was going to write Gutter Child till I finished Stone Thrower. I didn't know what I was going to write after Gutter Child until Gutter Child was complete. So do you do that intentionally or is that just no. the way your no, mind? No, that's just the way body... my mind works okay, because works. halfway through Gutter Child, I was like, this is a terrible book. No one is ever going to read it. Let's just write oh, something else. What's next? So for oh, a year, I was like, uh, something else, something else, something else. And nothing came. And so then I said, well, I'm going to finish Gutter Child so that at the very wow. least, a new idea comes. So, um, so yeah, I, I have no cool. sense of the next project. So okay. I think that creates a little bit of urgency too, because I'm okay. like, let's get this over okay. with. Um, so once I have an idea, I try and think it through a fair bit. Um, this is something I've learned over time that I can save myself a lot of time if I think through some of the key factors at the start okay. instead of just writing. They call it pan planner or pantser. Okay. And I'm, I'm much more of a, a planner. Okay. So and and I so I will, like thinking about it means taking notes or yeah, that kind taking of, okay. notes, like maybe making a bit of an outline. outline. Okay. Um, my first draft is usually like this tragic speed through of the manuscript where I'm just like, she goes here and he goes here and they go there and this goes here and then this happens and this happens, this happens, the end. And it's like 50 pages <laughs> and I'm like, oof, okay. now I got to fill this out. Oh, I fill it. Put yeah, the, so put that's the like meat on the little, bones kind exactly, of thing. Okay, meat on the cool. bones. So then I'll go through and I'll add detail to the next version and then I'll kind of be like, oh, the plot's a mess. I need to like figure out what is the time frame that this mm. is actually happening? What time of day? And let's add some description. And so those will all happen like in layers. And when I work in layers, I type out the, the draft and then I print it and then I hand edit the printed version mm. and then I plug those edits in okay. and then I read it on the computer and then I, so I mix up, I mix, um, writing, uh, typing and yep. writing by hand. Okay. Um, that seems to help me with like tone and a couple of things. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's that, it's that until it's done. And sometimes in that process, I will give the manuscript to my editor or my agent and they'll kind of say, okay, this is what you need to work on. Or, um, I think you can have this done in a year and we'll publish it on this day. Okay. Um, and sometimes I'm just working on my own, just doing whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I'm reading a lot or watching movies, reading for me, especially listening to audiobooks is really, really helpful for my writing mm. because I can hear good writing. And I can work towards that. And that's, that's cool. that makes a big difference wow. when my work is, is yeah. struggling. Like any craft, you can yeah. you can intentionally try to improve at it and get yes. better at it. Yes. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Um, what about practicalities like time of day time or of day. space mm -hmm. or yeah. yeah, how do all those little details work for you for the, you know, the prime yeah. writing, you know, yeah. Yeah, I've learned 
to do, I can do things anywhere, almost anywhere, in okay. the car, in a coffee shop, anywhere. Um, I usually have two kinds of ways that I work. One is plugging in edits. So it's very manual. I don't, I can watch a movie. I can listen to music. I can be in the, I can do anything while I'm entering in edits. It's mm -hmm. very like, just follow the instructions. Um, the one where I need to like really hear the story and figure things out, I need to be in a quiet place. So okay. sometimes that's my office. Sometimes that's a coffee shop. Sometimes I go on retreats. I go like away mm. for a few days um, and I write where it's like there's no computer or there's no phone or, you know, kind of like focused writing time. And that's usually when the manuscript is in a decent place but needs some like really important detail, okay. attention to detail. Yeah. So it really depends on what like kind of layer I'm at, how far along I am and what I'm actually doing okay. in terms of where Different that space for the different yeah. pieces yeah. that you need to put and together. And my prime, my prime creative time yeah. is like 8 a.m. to 12 Okay. That's when my brain is operating at its best it in is. terms so of mornings, like yeah. computer based sit down okay. type work. Yeah. 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 Work out a little bit in the morning and then I'm like, okay. In the zone. So a workout would be part of preparing. Yeah. You know, kind of I, thing like a you know, baseball player does, they got all the yeah. ritual before they get in. I, our daughter uh, is writing music these days mm. and she's discovered that, you know, if she does a few things before she gets into it, it helps get her into the space, right? Yeah. Go for a walk, have a coffee. Like it's a little workout, get the blood flowing yeah. and then boom, you know, but yeah. So what's that? It what's, depends. It depends on the routine? zone. If I'm, if I'm in a difficult, like if the sun's not out, I don't generally like writing. So okay. like working out a little bit, like I found now the weather is getting nicer. I'm like, Ooh, I can write as soon as I get okay. up. But when I wake up and it's dark and I'm still kind of in that mm -hmm. stage, like yeah. I always use a weekend as a good example of what I would do. And on a weekend, if I sleep in, I might start writing right away and then I might work out and then do more writing okay. afterwards. Or I might work out and then write. It depends on on mm. on where I'm at. Where I'm at in the process is a big thing too. Because if you're at a hard part in the editing process, if you don't know what's wrong with your manuscript mm -hmm. and you have to work on it, working out kind of helps. Mm. It kind of relieves okay. that tension. Yeah. Yeah. But if I'm in a good spot, I'm in a really good place right now, I'm like, get going. Yeah. open it up. Let's go. The, the hour cool. is here. I don't want to mess it up. Yeah. You know? yeah. The, yeah. the, uh, the word awareness is coming to me. Like yeah. Just being aware of what you need to do, but also how you're feeling yes. and just doing what's needed. Yeah. 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 Um, one more on this one, because I could go all day on this. It's so <laughs> cool. So so you've been at it for some time now, for several years. Um, what what have you learned about the practice itself yeah. of writing? Like like that, yeah. you know, okay, I, I, that, that I, I wouldn't do that anymore. Yeah, how have you grown? What have you learned? Well, I've learned the importance of doing things over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's one thing I learned from my dad's life and writing his story and, and realizing like I am not going to be a professional football player and I'm not going to throw stones at trains and then become a, a professional football player. But what I've learned from that part of his life is – doing things over and over and over again that people don't see mm. that benefits the things people do see. Mm. And so <laughs> uh, that. just that practice has mm -hmm. been really, really important for me. And then I think I've also learned that the best writers really pay attention to craft and mm. pay attention to the quality of their writing. And the quality of your writing can change based on your audience, like how the quality of your writing for a children's book mm. or a middle grade story sure. or, or a YA versus an adult, they they change a little, but the practice of making your writing clean and clear does not really change. Mm. And so really trying to personally develop that skill. I used to lean a lot on my agent and my editor to kind of help me, like figure out this problem. And I'm now realizing like that these are my problems to figure mm. out. The best writers, the like, top level writers are giving their work to their editors at a point that it's essentially done. Okay. There's a little bit that they're going to like mm. weigh in on, but they're giving it like really quality work by mm. the time they pass it to their editor. And I used to kind of go back and forth. I would give drafts that I knew were not ready, but like, help me. Um, and now I'm, I'm really trying okay. to solve that myself. Like, what's the problem? I also have a little cheat that I use called a buddy book. And so when I'm picking a when I'm writing my book, once I figure out what the tone, the, the the approach is, what style of book I'm writing, I find a book that's similar and I use that book as a guide. Mm. How does it open the chapter? How do they close the chapters? Mm. What are the transitions between chapters like? And I really try mm. and kind of mimic the things that I think are really strong about wow. it. Yeah, I love the commitment to learning yeah. as you go and growing. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Looking at other stuff, the humility to yes. look at other stuff. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 
I'd like to have one more question if I, if I, if I could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, now I forget what it was. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I was just thinking about something. Anyway, I lost it. Maybe it'll come back. Mm, Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Okay. Oh, just the, the discipline that it takes to, and people don't always say, oh, I know the team, the team, the team. Mm. So you mentioned about other people who are yeah. involved in the process. And, yeah. and I just realized as you're talking, it's not just you. Like, I think people think author, writer, yeah. solo effort. Yeah. Um, what is it like? to have a team that you're working with and how do those roles come together, you know, for the best finished product? I think the team is really important because I could not care less about the legal matters. I don't even really care about the money. I know that sounds really like vain, but I, it's just too much to care about. Like mm -hmm. it's too much to, to worry about. Like, is this advance enough? The, the thing with books is it's an advance. So it's always a loan. You always have to earn that money back. Mm. So I just leave the legal stuff, the money cool. stuff to my agent, who will also weigh in on the creative stuff and provides really great advice um, and sort of career direction advice. That's what she's really amazing for that. Um, and then on the other side, my editor, I feel like my relationship with her is like the reader, the, mm. the reader that I'm going to give it to. Mm. Um, and she and I are very different and also very similar in some ways, but she's, she's white um, and a lot of my stories are about blackness mm, and black identity. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. that sometimes creates a, a challenge and a problem, but it also creates a benefit mm. um, in the sense that, you know, I'm black and like, what are my readers going to uh, okay. think of it as, as white women or as whatever. black and white readers. So yeah, for yeah. me, it's about mm. allowing her to fill in gaps that I have. Okay. And then also finding other people, even beta readers, they call them friends mm -hmm. um, who will fill the gaps that she has. Mm -hmm. And so that team becomes really important in mm -hmm. those later stages. Mm -hmm. When when I changed the ending to Gutter Child, mm -hmm. my beta readers were so important. I had two black women um, reading the book who I deeply respect. And I went to them and was like, I'm thinking about taking these this chapter off. And they were like, I love it. Mm -hmm. And I went to my editor and she was like, and it was one of those times when I was like, uh, I'm going to have to lean on on their lived sure. experience yeah. for this. Yeah. And I'm going to have to like push you beyond yours. Yeah, yeah. Because um, yeah. ultimately it is your decision. It is You're my getting decision. input from others. Yeah. For sure. And yeah. I realized when Gutter Child would go out in the world, I would be the one that would have to defend it, not her. Yeah. And that, Good for you. Um, yeah, so it became really mm. important to just mm. stick with my gut. Mm. Cool. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. You also are involved in this festival that mm -hmm. comes up every every year. Yeah, uh, yeah Fold. Yeah. So Festival of Literary Diversity. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a bit about that. How did that get started, and what is that? What is that all about? Yeah, that's my baby, my other nice, baby. Nice. Um, uh, the Fold. I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because writing books just isn't <laughs> enough. That's just not <laughs> yeah, enough. Yeah. I'm not busy enough from yeah, that. Yeah. Clearly. Um, no, in um, 2014, I was, you know, working on The Stone Thrower. I was going around to other literary festivals. Actually, I wasn't working on The Stone Thrower at that point. Stone Thrower had been out for two years. Um, and I was going to other literary festivals and I was noticing some like some gaps. You know, a lot of the festivals were very white. A lot of the audience was very white, very old. Not a problem, but I really felt like alone when mm. I was at these festivals. And I loved going. Mm -hmm. I loved the conversations. Um, but I also saw things happening to black and, and marginalized authors when they were invited on panels to talk about just race or diversity and they weren't leading the workshops and they weren't, you know, on panels about craft. And so I um, was watching a similar complaint rise in the States, the We Need Diverse Books movement. And I um, read an article here about the problem existing in Canada as well. And I did what any person would do. I decided to start a literary festival. <laughs> No, uh, I, I don't <laughs> know. Course. It's yeah. one of those things where I remember reading the article uh, and saying like, you know, Canada has this problem and we need more um, racialized folks working as editors and publishers and literary festival directors. And I remember looking through that list and being like, no, no, oh, oh, festival director. That seems like something I could do. And then pitching the idea to my agent and saying, I think I'm going to start a literary festival for underrepresented yeah. voices. And she was like, that's very ambitious. And she that, was kind that, of like, a nice way of saying you're crazy. I think, yeah, right? and, yeah, but it was a really nice way because I was like, ambitious. Yes, that is who I am. That's what I great. am is great. This is like, it felt very affirming, <laughs> even though cool. I think she was kind of like, mm, are yeah. you sure? That's awesome. And so I spent the next two years putting up the idea for the Festival of Literary Diversity, registering it as a business, um, working with the city of Brampton to get the festival um, into downtown spaces. It was in City Hall and we had events at PAMA and we do it every spring. Yeah. Uh, the first weekend in May. And we also ended up down the road uh, developing a kids festival in the mm. fall. 
Um, but the real push for me was I wanted a festival that centered and started with underrepresented and nice. marginalized voices. And I wanted to give them the opportunity to talk about diversity, but I also wanted to give them the opportunity to talk about craft and to give them the choice. Um, and then I also wanted to create opportunities for writers of all kinds to have access to the kinds of answers and information awesome. they would need to wow. write. Because there are like the disabled community is extremely underrepresented in writing. And I think it's so important to provide opportunities to see like, this is something you can do. This mm -hmm. is a space that's available to you. Uh, and so that's really what the fold has become. It's become like this place where marginalized authors are represented, but it's also a place where new writers can find awesome. space. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm thinking with some people, I just want to get connected into this. It's, <laughs> and I'm thinking about what you said earlier about how you you come from a place of privilege yeah. and having had the opportunity where not everyone does, yeah. regardless of color of their skin. And that's awesome. Um, how can people help? How can people yeah. support this? It's a it's a, a significant event in Brampton yeah. Yeah. Um, around a cause that hopefully everyone believes in. We yeah. do for sure and want to help more. Yeah. So yeah, how can people get involved? How can people support this? Yeah, I think there's yeah. really simple ways people can support in terms of even just following us on social media. We're at The Fold on um, Instagram and Twitter, the Festival of Literary Diversity on Facebook. I think following, looking at the content, liking it, sharing okay. it, all that keeps the content growing, okay. spreading, keeps yeah. our sponsors really excited. <laughs> that's um, and that's like really simple. Yeah. I think the next step too is also attending and getting mm, involved. Nice. Um, the festival, I think a lot of people don't know what a literary festival is or what it looks like when yeah, they'll get yeah, there, yeah. but it really is conversations with authors on stage talking about, you know, if you've enjoyed this and hearing me talk about my writing process and how I wrote Gutter Child, that's very much what happens on all of the panels. And they just have different kind of focuses and subject matter. Cool. We also do workshops. Um, so learning how to write a memoir or learning how to navigate the publishing industry, um, and then one of the things that's happened since COVID is we actually developed a virtual platform mm. um, and we've been doing virtual events for the festival. And so the festival opens um, with four days of virtual events and closes with four days of in-person events. And the virtual days are actually really important to me mm. because to me, they're the most accessible days. Mm. No matter who you are or where you're at in life, you can attend the virtual days and not only can you attend, but you're in the exact same position as the authors and moderators mm. that are taking part in the event. Everybody's at home or mm. yeah. or travel, whatever they're doing, they're in yeah. a fixed place, looping in from the internet. And that feels really special to me. Um, we do this really cool event where you, it's called the Writer's Hub, and you can actually talk with publishing professionals and editors and publishers and publicists. And you can jump into a virtual chat with these folks that you might never come across Amazing. in everyday life without paying a fortune. Yeah. Um, and so that that for me is like, please come. If you if you're thinking about writing a book, cool. if you've been planning to write a book, if you're working on a book, like these, the, these are the conversations that really matter. These are the moments that matter. Um, and then our in-person events are really fun because they're designed for people who may not also be book lovers. Mm. You know, my husband does not read as much as I do, I shall say. I'll just say that. Um, but he <laughs> came to the the Great Readception, which is a literary cabaret last year. And that's six authors reading from their book to live music. Mm. And he loved it. Awesome. And so many people come and they're like not big readers, but they're like, I want that book or I loved that author. And it's it's like a concert. It's a show. It's it's really fun. Um, so there's lots of things, no matter big reader, small reader, just a good time to have in Brampton. Cool. Well, we'll get that information in our, in our at the end of the, in our post-it notes so and get you. the socials. And it's at the Rose. It's at the Rose, Here yes. in Brampton. Yes. Every, All the every year, that's events. kind of the place these days. That's, yes. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah nice. that's where nice. we've been able to have it at the Rose. And um, that's a really, it, it's important to me too, being in, in downtown Brampton. I know Bramptonites are kind of like, oh so hard to sometimes we yeah. feel like it's so hard to get downtown Brampton but it's a great place for people coming out of town actually yeah. the large majority of our attendees are from Toronto cool. Kitchener Mark Markham um and so it's a really great place people can just hop on the go train or go bus nice. and pop off yeah. right in front of the theater and getting people downtown Brampton is a good thing because we know. all know who in Brampton we want to kind of build up we a little bit of downtown up, for sure you know, it's been it. under construction for that, a while that is, <laughs> that is so so awesome okay yes let's finish with a little good news podcast rapid fire if sure. we could. Oh, yeah yeah cool i'm terrible cool. at rapid fire okay. i always make it a longer answer than it's <laughs> no supposed worries, to be no worries <laughs> that's okay so what's the best thing going on in your in your home and your family these days uh, my son's basketball. 
Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a really good basketball player and he's been playing really well and working really hard. And That's it's, cool. it's, it's so much fun. A lot of stress, but lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> as a cheering parent, it's a cheering parent. I keep stats as like a coping mechanism because I'm like, I can't yell at the <laughs> yeah, refs or awesome. yell at anyone if I have to like write down who made that. Oh, uh, love it. So, love it. Yeah. Uh, best thing going on in your community, in your neighborhood these days? Oh, just nice weather coming, mm. like just being outside and mm -hmm. outdoors on the front porch. Like mm -hmm. there's a, an important shift that happens when the weather gets nice and there's this real window before it's too hot yeah, <laughs> right? Yes. and you're like in the AC where everyone just sort of steps outside their house and then one person comes out and another person comes out yeah. another person absolutely that's, that's the best and after right a long now. winter it's just right? oh, yeah. it's new just life so right? new nice. life for sure so yeah nice. cool okay last one best thing going on in our world oh mm -hmm. this is the hardest mm -hmm. one what mm -hmm. is good that's mm -hmm. going on in our mm -hmm. world um I think probably the best thing that's going on in our world, even though it probably doesn't feel like it for everybody, mm. is just a deeper conversation about inclusion. Yeah. Um, I think that I always say diversity takes more work, but it always reaps better results. And I really believe that. Mm. I really believe when you think about the people that you're excluding and you work towards making room for them it makes everything, everything mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's a really messy yeah. process to yeah. get there. There's yeah. a lot of resistance. Um, and so I think the best thing that's happening are these very hard yeah. and messy conversations around it. Yeah. Um, but I I have to trust that it's going to lead to better results. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Oh, thanks, Jail, so much. Mm -hmm. Really, really awesome to be with you. Yeah, I appreciate so you being on the podcast the today. Love to say a prayer for you before we close. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, cool, cool. Mm. That loving and gracious God could feel you in the midst of this conversation for sure. Thank you for your your uh, being at the center of, of all that we've talked about today. Just just beautiful the way that you have blessed Jael with a with a gift and love how it came about. I love the, your process in her life where the next book gets revealed when the current one is done. Just can you to give her all that she needs to keep writing and keep blessing the world. That we pray for this beautiful festival fold. Um, that uh, it would continue to raise up those that maybe wouldn't otherwise get a chance to to write, um, to lead, to to um, be more than than they they might have thought they could ever be. And we we just pray that for you're going to do blessing um, on that on that festival and and let us all jump in at whatever level and whatever way uh, we can. So thanks again for this time, this conversation, and uh, for the life that you're going to bless us with. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks again so much. Yeah. Thanks for having yeah, me. You bet. Thanks, everybody, for being a part of uh, the Good News Podcast family. Always, always good to be with you. God bless you and see you again real soon. So if I'm being honest with you, you know what? I have to say, I was actually a little bit nervous before this conversation. I don't know, like this, you know, this this person seemed like a celebrity to me and uh, yeah, never, never been with a best-selling author. But you know what? No surprise. Just a beautiful person. So real, so genuine, so down to earth. Could have talked for ever with her. I just look forward to continued connections because this is this is just an incredible individual who I know I felt so blessed uh, to be connected to today. I, I hope you did as well. I hope you caught that. Um, and just I love her, the, the way that her life has has unfolded. You know, you say yes to something <laughs> and then you just never know where it might lead. Wrote this book really for her dad and then it led to this writing career where she is making such a difference in the world today. Students, classes are reading Gutter Child as a way to, to learn about anti-black racism and racial equality and making the world a better place. And I just hope and pray that more and more people, more and more students, uh, schools, classes, jump on board and read through these incredible resources that will be a blessing for, for years to come. So just uh, thanks again for being, being a part of the, the conversation today. You know, I, I also was very interested, as you could probably tell, in the way the process of writing that JL really disciplines herself to do, but also does it with a, a freedom and a grace, a, an awareness of, is it a day to jump? right in and right because i'm excited i'm ready or is it a day to just you know slowly enter in get a little workout in get a walk in um love the way that she has that kind of awareness and that she's so committed to growing in her craft and and being intentional about learning from from others the humility that that is at the heart of that oh man just love her love what she's doing really would encourage all of us to support the work that she's doing especially around the fold festival festival of literary diversity check it out their web website is thefoldcanada.org or you can look at their socials, The Fold, and please, people wonder, how can we support
support this kind of work, of really working for racial justice? Well, here's a very simple way. Uh, share it, like it, uh, check out their content, or even better, go to the festival and learn and grow and be part of something special. And you will be making a difference and really working on something that I think we all want to work on, racial equality. So friends, thanks so much. Love you and appreciate you and grateful for these conversations that we get to have together. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Good News with Jamie Holtam. Always good to be with you. Hope to see you again real soon.